Welcome to my PMQ's highlights, where we'll be dissecting the most powerful moments in Parliament from this Wednesday's PMQ's. And let's start with the very first question from SNP MP for Dundee West, Chris Law, who makes a very powerful statement, an equally powerful question about both humanitarian aid and for UK nationals to flee. Yeah, the Rafa border crossing from besieged Gaza into Egypt has been hit by several Israeli airstrikes, causing absolute terror for those who urgently need this crossing open to escape. Nadia El Nakla, an elected councillor in my city of Dundee and the wife of Scotland's First Minister, has had to take calls from her parents, Elizabeth and Majid, who, like all others trapped in Gaza, have been describing the horrors of death and indiscriminate killings everywhere. Members of her family were hit yesterday by a rocket from a drone, and Nadia's mother was saying her final goodbyes this morning, adding, Last night was the end for me. Better if my heart stops, and then I'll be at peace. I can't take another night. Mr Speaker, with military action intensifying and the death toll rapidly rising, the Prime Minister's first responsibility must be to bring British citizens home. So can the Prime Minister please give his personal assurances that every single step has been taken to open the Rafa crossing for both humanitarian aid and for UK nationals like Nadia's family to flee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, of, thought, uh, of course the thoughts of everyone in this House will be though with those families affected by what is happening in Israel and in Gaza. And I can give the Honourable Gentleman that assurance that we are doing everything in our power to ensure the safety of British nationals that are caught up in all of this, uh, including my calls with leaders across the region, particularly around opening the Rafa border crossing, which is why I prioritised talking to President Sisi last week. And we continue to have dialogue both with the Israelis and the Egyptians about the Rafa crossing. Now, I don't know whether our Prime Minister will have the influence but something tells me he has about as much influence on this situation as much as I have. But then Sadid Javid brought up the situation with the Jewish attacks that's been happening recently. I'm proud to live in the most successful multiracial democracy in the world. But it does, uh, it saddens me and I think it shames this whole house that British Jews have been subject to such vile abuse and hatred in recent days. Anti-Semitism and all hate crimes, they fly in the face of British values. And we should not allow events abroad, no matter how horrific they are, to be used to sow seeds of division in our own country. So whilst I welcome all the actions that my right honourable friend is taking to, to fight hate crime, to bring people together, May I uh, ask him to consider urgently an immediate and specific policy of revoking the visas of any foreign national that commits an, an act of anti-Semitism or any other hate crime? Yeah. 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 Well, Mr Speaker, I completely agree with my right honourable friend who himself has done so much over the years to fight anti-Semitism. The increase in incidents we've seen over the past week is utterly sickening and this government will do whatever it takes to keep our Jewish community safe. That's why we've provided an additional £3 million of funding to support the Community Security Trust, and we are working with the police to ensure that hate crime and the glorification of terror is met with the full force of the law. Under our existing immigration rules, we do have the power to cancel a person's presence in the UK if it is not conducive to the public good. Mr Speaker, we will not tolerate this hatred, not in our country, not in this century. Let's remember the words he used about not tolerating hate and division. Eh? But there were two questions that stuck out for me from the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, after he had welcomed the new member for Rutherglen and Hamilton West. The terrible news last night came as we are still mourning the terrorist attack on Israel last week. Jews taken hostage, mutilated, slaughtered. <laughs> And yesterday I met the families of some of the British hostages held by Hamas. Every minute of every hour of every day, they hope for good news, but fear the worst. They know the lives of their loved ones are in the hands of murderers. It's unimaginable agony. Israel has a right, a duty, to defend itself from Hamas, keep its people safe and bring hostages home. But isn't it clear that if Hamas had a single concern for human life, a single concern for the safety of the Palestinian people, 
then they would never have taken these hostages, and they should release them immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, it is important consistently for us to remember that Israel has suffered a shockingly brutal terrorist attack, and it is Hamas and Hamas alone that is responsible for this conflict. Uh, our thoughts are rightly with those who have been taken hostage and their families. The distress they are feeling will be unimaginable uh, for all those affected. Uh, I will be meeting with some of the families and offering them all the support of the British Government to get their relatives home. We are working around the clock with our partners and allies to secure their freedom. And importantly, in amongst my other regional calls, I spoke specifically with the Emir of Qatar yesterday on this very issue, which we discussed at length. The Qatari government is taking a lead and working intensely to help release hostages using their contacts in the region, and we are working very closely with them to ensure the safe return of the British hostages. Kirsten. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, I also met charities with staff working in Gaza and heard their accounts of the harrowing humanitarian crisis. Children fleeing their homes, hospitals barely able to function. The lights are going out and the innocent civilians of Gaza are terrified that they will die in the darkness, out of sight. International law must always be followed. Hamas are not the Palestinian people and the Palestinian people are not Hamas. Does he agree that medicines, food, fuel and water must get into Gaza immediately? This is an urgent situation and innocent Palestinians need to know that the world is not just simply watching but acting to prevent a humanitarian catastrophe. Mr Speaker, as I said on Monday, an acute humanitarian crisis is unfolding to which we must respond. It is right that we support the Palestinian people because they are victims of Hamas yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is why we have provided a further £10 million in humanitarian aid for people in the region. And we are working through preemptively moving aid and relief teams to Egypt, specifically to the El Arish airfield. We are working with local partners like the Egyptian Red Crescent and the United Nations primarily, and deploying Navy assets to the region, as well as exploring how we can support logistical requirements. And I've also raised this issue of humanitarian access in all of my conversations as a priority with every leader in the region, and we will continue working with them to get aid to where it is needed as quickly as possible. Now, I haven't said anything about the Israel and Palestine situation because I don't know, for, know enough about it, really. And to me, it just seems, for some people, it just depends on what date you want to start from to suit their own narrative for blame, if you know what I mean. I'll see some disturbing footage with a note underneath a tweet saying that this whole footage is all just disinformation to a point where I don't know what to believe. It also seems to me that if you criticise one side or the other, you're either an establishment shill or anti-Semitic. And the ones I really feel sorry for are those that are caught in the middle of this conflict on either side. You know what I mean? It'd be either one of the hostages, family members of the hostages waiting by the phone, as well as those who have family members in Gaza, as well as those living in fear, thinking tonight could be their last night on earth. Now, I could be wrong, and I hope I am wrong on this, but I get the feeling that the Palestine people seem to be a little bit of an afterthought. Now, if I'm wrong, tell me, because I hope I am wrong on this, because for me, cutting off electricity, water and supplies to those in Gaza doesn't sound like that would be acceptable under international law to me. I also get the feeling that Israel have the right to defend itself as long as it's done under international law line is just a cover for, from where I'm looking at, we have no influence on this situation at all. So a safe face and look as though we, as a government, do have influence on the international stage. We'll just say that Israel has the right to defend itself as long as it's under international law. Does that make sense? Now, leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn, asked a very interesting question and one I'd like to see happen. 
thank you, Mr. Speaker. We all continue to unequivocally condemn the abhorrent terrorist attack on the Jewish people and the Israeli state. We fully support the defeat of Hamas and, of course, the safe return of all hostages who have been taken. So, too, I hope, do we all share the same common humanity of protecting civilians and condemning any acts of con collective punishment against the Palestinian people. In that regard, many of the images emanating from Gaza in recent days will shock us all to the core. So can I ask the Prime Minister, will he join with us on these benches and call for an immediate ceasefire in the region? Mr Speaker, we believe that Israel does have a right to defend itself, to protect its people and to act against terrorism and ensure that the awful attack that we've seen from Hamas cannot happen again. And unlike Hamas, the Israelis, including the President, have made it clear that their armed forces will operate in accordance with international law. And we will continue to urge the Israelis to take every precaution to avoid harming civilians. Stephen Flynn. Mr Speaker, my ask for a ceasefire is done with all sincerity, sincerity to protect civilians, but also to ensure that we have the safe creation of humanitarian corridors, yeah. humanitarian corridors which will allow for food, for water and for vital medicines to get into Gaza, but also for innocent civilians caught up in this terrible conflict to flee. In respect of those who wish to flee, can I ask the Prime Minister what early consideration, if any, his government has given to the creation of a refugee resettlement scheme akin to that previously put in place for Syrian nationals, Afghani nationals and, of course, Ukrainian nationals? Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, I am proud that we are already one of the most significant contributors to the United Nations' efforts to support Palestinian refugees, and our funding supports around 5.8 million refugees annually. And on Monday, we announced a significant increase in our funding uh, to, of aid to the region, including to the UN to support refugees. Uh, with regard to humanitarian aid, as I said before, we are already working through preemptively moving aid and relief teams into the region, but critically the most important thing is to open up access for that aid to get into Gaza, which is why our conversations with the Egyptians and others are so critical. We continue to work closely with allies to find every way to get that aid to the people who need it as quickly as possible. To be honest, something tells me that the President of Israel isn't going to fear the full might of our Prime Minister squeak, is he? He doesn't didn't really answer the question for me either. He just seemed to parrot that Israel have the right to defend its people and all that. Sounded like a bit of a cop-out for me, but what do you guys think? He also seemed to steer well clear of that question for a refugee resettlement scheme as well, didn't he? Clearly could feel the evil eyes of our rancid home secretary burrowing into the back of his head. But then... Labour MP for Lewisham East, Janet Derby, asked our fearless Prime Minister if he is the leader for change, why is he allowing the lunatics in his party near our state spending and the NHS budget? Then to prove a point, one of the lunatics gets up to prove a point. Mr Speaker, members from the party opposite have said the way to fix the economic crisis that they have caused is to cut state spending by 200 billion and to freeze NHS budget. When will the Prime Minister stand up to the extremists in his party and condemn these ideas? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, weeks after becoming Prime Minister, we announced a significant increase of almost £14 billion for the NHS and social care. Uh, we followed that up with the first long term workforce plan in the NHS's history to ensure that we train the doctors and nurses we need uh, for the future. That demonstrates our commitment to the NHS and we also, I'm pleased to say, reached a settlement with over one million NHS workers, including our nurses, for a full, a fair and affordable pay rise. So Desmond Swig. Aid poured into Gaza in 2005 when Israel withdrew. Enlightened governance could have made a success of it. 
It is Hamas that has turned it into hell, hasn't it? Thanks for stating the obvious, Desmond Swain. I want to let that man near a pencil without an instruction manual and also a responsible adult in supervision. But back to some reality, and for me, this was Question of the Day from Labour MP for Bristol South, Karen Smith, about a certain candidate from Tamworth. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In Bristol South, around a third of children live in poverty, most of them in working households. It's about the same as in Tamworth, where the Conservative candidate for tomorrow's election made foul-mouthed comments about families struggling to make ends meet. This is his Conservative Party. Will he condemn that candidate's comments? Well, Mr Speaker, I'm proud of our record supporting people with a cost of living. Thanks to the actions that we've taken, we've paid half of a typical family's energy bill last winter, frozen fuel duty, boosted the national living wage to record level levels, and 8 million people across this country are now receiving direct cost of living payments worth £900. Whilst we're helping people with a cost of living, all Labour's ideas are doing are costing them a fortune. Didn't condemn it, did he? practically endorsed it as well. So if you're a Tory voter on your downers and unemployed due to 13 years of Tory mismanagement, he agrees you should do what Andrew Cooper said. Your Prime Minister is telling you to go and do one. Then that line at the end about, you know, a party that hasn't been in power for 13 years costs households a fortune from a man who travels short distances by helicopter on the public purse. is just too hilarious to believe, isn't it? But this week's PMQs cannot end without a bit of racism and gaslighting, can it? Take it away, Tory MP for Hartlepool, if you know where it is, Jill Mortimer. On Sunday, Terence Carney, a 70-year-old Hartlepudlian, was murdered by an asylum seeker. The people are afraid and angry. Every week, my office is besieged by asylum seekers. My staff are intimidated by young men. The fact is, most of them are illegal migrants who should be expelled. My thoughts and sympathies are with Mr Carney's family and friends, as and all my constituents are affected by this heinous crime. However, sympathy is not enough. They deserve action, and I am demanding it. Will the Prime Minister take action? Will he make sure enforcement is delivered? Will he ensure that people who have no right to be here are expelled? Enough is enough. I want these people out of Hartlepool now. Mr Speaker, as my my honourable friend knows, I'm unable to comment on cases which are currently before the court, but can I join her expressing my sympathies to families affected? And I would like to reassure her that this government is doing everything we can to tackle illegal migration and the harm it causes by removing those with no right to be here in the UK. We have excellent long-standing relationships to return people to many countries. We are returning thousands of people more this year than we have done in the past, and we will continue to use every avenue at our disposal to ensure that it is only this country and this government who decides to come here and not criminal gangs. If her thoughts are with this gentleman's family, maybe she shouldn't use the death to use to stereotype asylum seekers. Also, as Tasmin Baxter, Executive Director of external affairs at the Refugee Council said that most of the majority of people who come to the UK seeking asylum would be recognised as refugees in need of protection. Also saying, and I quote, there are people whose lives were at risk and who have had to flee from the horrors of war and persecution. We would urge parliamentarians to steer clear of hostile and misleading rhetoric, which could have dangerous consequences for vulnerable people in the asylum system. Also, Rosie Carter, Director of Policy at Hope Not Aid, believes that MPs have a duty to choose their language carefully by saying, and I quote, playing up to racist stereotypes about asylum seekers and scaremongering, simply not acceptable or responsible behaviour from an MP. Hope has recorded a sharp increase in far-right anti-migrant activity around the country, which can tear apart communities. This is made worse when politicians do not act with care 
and calm in difficult situations. I've also heard that she might have prejudiced a live case as well. Well, if she has, where to go, Jill Mortimer. So for once, I'm in total agreement with Conservative MP for Bromsgrove when he said this. Anti-Semitism and all hate crimes, they fly in the face of British values. And we should not allow events abroad, no matter how horrific they are, to be used to sow seeds of division in our own country. I wholeheartedly agree. So that was my PMQ's highlights and my thoughts. Was there any question in PMQs you thought were important? And if you did, let me know down below. And until the next time, I shall bid you farewell. Have a lovely weekend and hopefully see you Monday, my friends.